Welcome English 1102 friends. This is a guide to the story of the things they carried by Tim O'Brien. This goes in the conflict and combat section, obviously. Um, this is a story about the Vietnam War. Tim O'Brien, who is still alive as I'm making this video, although he was born in 1946, he served in the Vietnam War. Um, he was actually drafted uh, and served a year in Vietnam. Uh, this has become if not the most famous book about the Vietnam War, then one of them. And especially this story, which is about a lieutenant in charge of a group of soldiers in uh, Vietnam, a group of foot soldiers, which Tim O'Brien himself was just a basic private um, foot soldier in Vietnam. Um, the real key to understanding this story is understanding that last word in the title, uh, carried. This story plays a lot with the idea of what these guys carry and the sort of emotional burdens and intellectual burdens that they carry and the sort of burden of fear and danger and the sort of trauma, you know, the, the sort of epiphany, the, or not the epiphany, the climax of this story, the big event that this story is built around is the death of one of the soldiers, this guy named Ted Lavender, and the idea, the problem of them having to carry, you know, the death that they see and the danger that they live with and all that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of um, it, there's a bunch of information in this story. Whenever I teach this story and students say, "Oh, this story's a little bit boring," the reason they feel like this story's boring is because there's a a bunch of listing in this story. There's lists of all the stuff these guys carry for all their different missions and all that stuff. And clearly, what that's doing in this story is there is this jump between what the guys physically carry in the story and the emotional. Uh, and the emotional stuff and the trauma that they also have to carry, like seeing this person that they know, this guy that they're serving with in the war die, but also the sort of fear that they might die and the danger that they have to live with, like I said. And the story sets that up even from the very beginning. Um, there's two things. There's two, uh, The main character in the story is the lieutenant, and the first couple of paragraphs of this story set up he is carrying this sort of love and crush on this girl um, that he was in love with, a girl named Martha, back home in New Jersey. And there is this divide between his feelings for her and his thinking about her and his being present in Vietnam and taking care of his guys. And you get that set up. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping. So you get this physical thing that he's carrying. The, the stuff with Martha has the double meaning because he's carrying these letters from her and he's carrying this pebble from her and these two pictures of her. He's physically carrying, you know, it has a little bit of weight, the, these letters and pictures and pebble. But he is also, you know, emotionally carrying this sort of crush on her and these thoughts of her and his mind wandering off to her and daydreaming. You know, when they are searching the tunnel, um, and he is worried about his guy down there getting hurt or getting killed in the tunnel. His mind wanders off to wondering what Martha's doing and thinking about that. So he's carrying, he's physically carrying the letters and the pictures, but he's also emotionally carrying the sort of thoughts of her, which he realizes at the end of the story he's got to let go of so he can totally be focused and totally be present in Vietnam. He even, right here, you get the letters weighed 10 ounces. They were signed, Love Martha. But Lieutenant Cross understood love was only a way of signing and didn't mean what he sometimes present, pretended it meant. And then down here, you jump down. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities or near necessities were P38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent. Here's the first of those. And you get this several times in this story, the lists of Kool-Aid and sea rations and canteen water. Um, Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches. Somebody carries a toothbrush and dental floss. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot outside the village of Tan K in mid-April. And this sets up right here, in the, even in the second paragraph, it sets up the big action, the big plot point of the story, which is that Lavender is going to get shot. And there is irony in the thing he, the things he carries, the tranquilizers and the marijuana, you find out later, are all to calm him down because he's scared and worried and nervous. Um, and the irony there is he's the one who's most scared and most worried and most nervous, and he is the one who dies. You know, he's having to calm himself down because he's so anxious all the time, and, and ultimately he is the one who dies. And you get the rest of, the rest of this paragraph 
Um, and the rest of this section is really just this s special things these guys carry. Like one of them carries a Bible. It's, they were called legs or grunts. To carry something was to hump it, as when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps. Um, and, and again, you get some of this jargon of the soldiers. Um, almost everyone humped photographs in his wallet. Lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha. And they carried, you know, part of the personal stuff they carry is, is pictures of people from back home. And, and, you know, back in the 1960s and 1970s, that's when people still carried physical pictures. Um, one of the other important moments in this story is when uh, the main character, the lieutenant, flashes back to this image of um, this memory of he and Martha going to watch Bonnie and Clyde. If you know anything about Bonnie and Clyde, which is a movie that came out in the late 1960s, um, at the time it came out, it was considered scandalous because there's like a lot of violence, especially for that time, violent like shootouts and stuff like that that were borderline scandalous at that time. Um, a dark theater, he remembered, and the movie was Bonnie and Clyde, and Martha wore a tweed skirt, and during the final scene, when he touched her knee, she turned and looked at him in a sad, sober way that made him pull his hand back. But he would always remember the feel of the tweed skirt and the knee beneath it. He remembered kissing her goodnight at the dorm door. Right then, he thought he should have done something brave. He should have carried her up the, up the stairs to a room and tied her to the bed and touched that left knee all night long. He should have risked it. And what you get right there, and the reason that's sort of an important moment is he thinks back to what being brave meant when he was back home. And it meant, you know, trying to touch this girl's knee or, or being a little bit more, like pursuing her a little bit more. And being brave in Vietnam and, and having courage and um, like showing your bravery means something totally different to him now when he's in Vietnam. And, and it takes bravery just to get up and keep going and not sort of collapse under the fear and, and anxiety. So part of what you're getting right there is him sort of existing in two different worlds, the world before the war and the world he is in now in Vietnam. And then you jump back and you get more physical stuff, more like concrete physical stuff, like the lieutenant carrying a 45 caliber pistol and, and them carrying radios and M&Ms and machine and uh, the, carrying the M60 machine gun and all this 23 pounds and 10 or 15 pounds of ammunition and 8.4 pounds and 14 pounds at maximum, all these, you know, all this stuff they're carrying, including um, they wrapped Lavender in the poncho. They carried him out to a dry patty, established security, and sat smoking a dead man's dope until the chopper came. One of the other uh, ironies of this story is after they all see Lavender get killed, get shot in the head, they, to calm themselves down from, from this awful thing they've seen, they smoke his marijuana to try to calm themselves down, just like he had used it to try to calm himself down and keep himself sort of leveled out. You jump back in this little section to a bunch of specific weights and stuff they're carrying, the M60, the M16, the M79, 3.5 pounds each and 14 ounces each, and they all carried at least one M18 colored smoke grenade, 24 ounces. You get all this, again, like I said, some, some students, when we're talking about this story, find this boring because you get just all this physical stuff, and he keeps coming back at you with it. In the first week of April before Lavender died, Jimmy Cross received a good luck charm from Martha. So now we're, back, we're away from the war and back to Martha. But also this physical thing, this little pebble that she sent him from the beach in New, in New Jersey, the Jersey Shore. Um, and you get a bunch of him daydreaming about her and daydreaming about walking on the beach with her. And then the story jumps you back. What they carried varied by mission. When a mission took them to the mountains, they carried mosquito netting, machetes, canvas tarps, extra bug juice. And so you go from these sort of daydreams and imaginings that he's thinking of back to the reality of the war and the, the concrete stuff that they have to carry, the physical, actual physical stuff they have to carry. Um... And then the story takes you right here where it says, On April 16th, when Lee Strunk drew the number 17, he laughed and muttered something and went down quickly. And the story jumps you to the main action of the story, the action, the scene where Lavender gets killed. And, the story, and there's more irony here. Um, there's more situational irony because um, Strunk, Lee Strunk draws the number 17 and has to t search this tunnel, which in the Vietnam War was one of the most dangerous things you could do. Um, the, Viet the North Vietnamese army will build these complex tunnel systems in the sides of mountains and then hide in there and shoot American soldiers or throw grenades at them or booby trap them or something like that. 
This is why none of these guys want to search these tunnels and they have to draw numbers to do it. It's because it's so dangerous and crawling, you crawl down in these dark tunnels and you had no clue what was down there and somebody might be waiting for you to you know, stab you or blow you up or something. Um, and the irony here is that Strunk crawls down in the tunnel. All the other guys are nervous and anxious and worried that he's doing this you know, dangerous thing. And, uh, and, event, and then finally, though, Strunk comes back out and he's okay. And, and nobody got hurt. Nobody died searching the tunnel. This dangerous thing, it worked out all right. Um, you see right there, a few moments later, Lee Strunk crawled out of the tunnel. He came up grinning, filthy but alive. Lieutenant Cross nodded and closed his eyes while the others clapped Strunk on the back and made jokes about rising from the dead. And the irony here is that they think everything's okay. They sort of relax. They're like, oh, Strunk's okay. You know, everything's okay. Lee Strunk made a funny ghost sound, a kind of moaning, yet very happy. And right then, when Strunk made that high, happy moaning sound, when he went, ah, ooh, Right then, Ted Lavender was shot in the head on his way back from peeing. He lay with his mouth open. The teeth were broken. There was a swollen black, black bruise under his left eye. The cheekbone was gone. And it's in the irony there is you expect, they guys all expect that everything's okay. They sort of, you know, Strunk survives this. And right as they sort of exhale and are like, whew, everything's okay. Then Lavender gets killed. Um, they think the danger is gone. And then one of them gets killed. But even... As Strunk is searching the tunnel, you get this jump back where the lieutenant is watching him search the tunnel and his mind wanders off and he's thinking about Martha. His mind's not focused on what's going on and keeping his guys safe. He can't help himself. His mind just wanders. Um, then suddenly, without willing it, he was thinking about Martha, the stresses, stresses and fractures, the quick collapse, the two of them buried alive under all that weight, dense, crushing love. And so when he should be focused on the tunnel and Strunk and keeping a safe perimeter for his guys while they're doing this dangerous thing, you know, his mind, Lieutenant Cross gazed at the tunnel, but he was not there. He was buried with Martha under the white sand at the Jersey Shore. And, his, and this is what he knows he has to stop and knows how he has to change when you get to the end of the story. He burns the letters, burns the pictures, because he knows he has to let Martha go and be totally in the war and be totally in Vietnam doing his job. Um... Lieutenant Cross carried his good luck pebble. Dave Jensen carried a rabbit's foot. And you jump back to the physical stuff they're carrying, not, not the emotional stuff. And the story walks you through. The, the, high, the climax of this story, you know, Lavender being killed, is, is tucked in. It, it's right sort of in the middle of the story. But, they, but you find out about it um, just in the second paragraph. There's a bunch of, it's not a mystery what's going to happen. You just find out exactly how it happens um, in the middle of the story. And the rest of the story sort of deals with them wrestling with and dealing with what happened. They carried USO stationery and pencils and pens. They carried sterno, safety pins, trip flares. We're back to all the physical stuff that they have to carry, um, all, all the weight that they have to carry. And then you jump back to after the chopper took Lavender away, Lieutenant Cross led his men to the village of Tonkay. They burned everything. They shot chickens and dogs. They trashed the village. They called in artillery and watched the wreckage. And so their response to seeing their friend die by this person, that this sniper that they never see and can never punish or catch is, they go to the nearest village and just burn it and destroy things and sort of act out their frustration and anxiety. Um, and, you see, and you see the lieutenant, Lieutenant Cross, break down and cry. He felt shame. He hated himself. He had loved Martha more than his men. And as a consequence, Lavender was now dead. And this was something he would have to carry like a stone in his stomach for the rest of the war. And again, we're back to the idea of carrying, and this thing that he has to carry now is not a physical thing, it's an emotional thing, it's just this different kind of burden. Um, and the rest of the story works you through the different guys dealing with what happened and their sort of takes on what happened and their takes on like dealing with seeing this death and danger and destruction around them. Till the, the story really leads you to the sort of emotional climax and the sort of center of the story, the key to the story, is this, um, it's right here. They were tough. They carried all the emotional baggage of men who might die. Grief, terror, love, longing. These were intangibles, but the intangibles had their own mass and specific gravity. They had tangible weight. 
that idea of the intangible and the tangible, that's really the key, the core to this story. If you don't know what intangible, 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 tangible things are things you can touch. You know, this, this pencil is tangible because I can hold it in my hand. Um, or this book is, is tangible because I can hold it in my hand. Tangible things are physical, material things you can hold. Intangible things are things that are real but not touchable or holdable. Like he says, like um, terror, love, longing, or fear, or hatred, or um, those kinds of things. Those are real and they affect people, but they're not tangible things you can hold in our hand that you can hold in your hand and what he's getting at right here is the things they carried are both tangible things and intangible things and each of them had their own as he says um, the intangibles had their own mass and specific gravity they had tangible weight and so what he's saying is these guys are weighed down by these things like fear of dying and um, and love for people back home and that they're thinking about and longing to just be back home and for the war to be over and stuff like that they carried the soldier's greatest fear, which was the fear of blushing. Men killed and died because they were embarrassed not to. This paragraph right here really gets at the core, the core idea of this story. That, you know, this jump between the intangible things and the tangible things. And both of them equally weigh on these guys and affect them. And you can see that right there as you get to the end of the story. Where Lavender's death has this, even though it's an intangible thing that the sort of sorrow and grief that Lieutenant Cross feels about it. That's an intangible thing, but it has this real tangible effect on the Lieutenant and he burns the letters and burns the pictures. Um, and is like, and realizes that he has to act different and be different. So again, it has this tangible effect on the morning after Ted Lavender died. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross crouched at the bottom of his foxhole and burned Martha's letters. Then he burned the photographs. There was a steady rain falling, but which made it difficult. But he used heat tabs and a sterno to build a small fire, screening it with his body. He realized it was only a gesture. Stupid, he thought. Sentimental, but mostly just stupid. Um, and he and he has to get he gets rid of these physical, tangible reminders of Martha because he knows he has to sort of get her out of the head. Uh, get her out of his head um, and then he decides commencing immediately he'd tell them they would no longer abandon equipment along the route they would police up their acts they would get their shit together and keep it together he would not tolerate laxity among the men there would be grumbling and maybe worse because their days would seem longer and their loads heavier but lieutenant jimmy cross reminded himself that his obligation was to be lo was not to be loved but to lead he would dispense with love. It was not now a factor. And if anyone quarreled or complained, he would simply tighten his lips and arrange his shoulders in the correct command posture. Um, and so he has to carry Lavender's death. Um, and and uh, he would dispense with love. It was not now a factor. That's obviously, he, he would, he's pushing Martha out of his mind. And, what's in, and what he's going to focus on now is leading his guys and try, trying to take care of them the best that he can. Um, and you see them at the end of the story moving out and, and he has changed this um, death and the grief and mourning that he feels about it has this tangible real effect on him. Um, and so what you get is this story of what these guys carry, all this physical stuff, but also all this emotional and mental stuff that they have to carry and deal with and this burden that the lieutenant takes on after Lavender dies, which is this additional, you know, he puts down some stuff, the, the love for Martha and the letters and the pictures, but he pick, takes on this burden. It's replaced by this burden that he takes on um, because he feels responsible for Lavender dying. I hope that helps you understand uh, the things they carried. Like I said, um, this is maybe the most famous story um, this is this story is from a book called The Things They Carried, and it's all different stories about this same platoon of soldiers. Each of the stories focuses on a different soldier. Um, hopefully, when you jump into the link um, in the in D2L, you just read the first story, the title story. Don't worry about the rest of them, like on the Rainy River. Just read the title story. That's all you need. If you have questions about this or about Tim O'Brien, um, he's written some other books that are also really interesting including about Vietnam, but some other stuff too. Anyway, I hope that helps you understand this specific story. If you got questions, just be in touch.